Okay, well, why don't we move on to osteogenic tumors today? Uh, Michael, why don't you take this one? Okay. Um, uh, excuse me, benign or 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 malignant? Well, I, let me. I'll get to it. Um, the 17-year-old female with chronic knee pain. No, no, I'm. I'm on, excuse me, John. Are you going to benign or malignant? Both. Osteogenic or both? Both. Both. Okay. Okay, so um, we see kind of marked, smooth periosteal reaction along the uh, the metadiaphyseal cortex of the distal femur. Okay. And I'm wondering if there, there looks like there's kind of a central lucency as well. Right in here. And it says they have pain. And so, now, oh, okay. So on the CT, we, we see that periosteal reaction is very smooth, non-aggressive appearance, and it's got a little central lucency with another kind of corticated dot. So this is probably an osteoid osteoma, since it's painful. There's some, I guess uh, less uh, likely than osteoid osteoma would, other thing you'd think of is, I don't, I mean, that's what I'd go with, but sure. other differences, maybe like a infection is probably very unlikely, but. Yeah, it could be a chronic infection. Uh, yeah, yeah, kind of I like with the sequestrum type thing. thing. Yeah. And here, here's the MR examination. So the MR kind of shows similar thing, periosteal reaction with that um, bright image on stir where that lucency is, and there's like kind of marked marrow edema in the adjacent um, femur. Okay. And there we can see the yeah. images there. Again, we can see that central nidus on the MR examination. Yeah. And this and is an osteoid osteoma. Good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So they can be cortical, which is the most common type. They can be in the medullary bone, in the trabecular bone, uh, and they can be subperiosteal, which is the rarest type. Okay, uh, Ashu, uh, yeah, Ashu, what do you think of this one? Um, looking at this plain films, uh, I'm not really seeing okay. too much okay, here. So this, these are the initial ones, AP and lateral. Okay. Here's the initial MR. Oh, okay. So here you can see some um, some uh, marrow replacing lesion, I think, within the lower cervical vertebral body, extending posteriorly to involve part of the posterior elements right there, um, increased T2 signal, low T1. Um, and it looks like it's going into the facet joint. Um, and here you can see it's it's uh, definitely involving that um, posterior right uh, vertebral body um, and it's extending pedicle, into right? the pedicle. Yep. And uh, and how old is this patient? 20, 20 years old, I guess. Twenty. Twenty year old. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the initial one. Okay, this is 16 okay. months later. Okay. Um, here I think you can see increased um, – I want to say there's there's some lucency there uh, along the right side, C7. Yeah, maybe here. some – yeah, maybe some so increased – The lesion was really in the pedicle area there. Yeah. A little hard to see. Here's the MR scan now. Okay, so it's it looks like it's it's growing and involving. Is it involving multiple vertebral bodies now, and it's yeah. more involving the posterior aspect? Yeah. Um, that facet and pedicle. Oh yeah, it's definitely ex more expansile. Um, just based on location, you know, you think about osteoblastoma. Good. And this. And there's the CT now. Yeah, yeah, you can see now. Yep, and you can see some some matrix too, some osteoid matrix. So I, I would good. Yeah, osteoblastoma. Very good. Hey, Jennifer, seventeen-year-old male. 
Okay, so here we see some cloud-like matrix along the middle third of the femoral diaphysis. There's some periosteal reaction and... Yeah, some hair on end appearance here too. Hair on end. So I'd be concerned about a malignant lesion such as osteosarcoma or Ewing sarcoma. Um, here on the MRI, we have some T1 and T2 images. And again, we can see that periosteal reaction um, and also some edema. So there's some edema in the medullary bone here. The cortex looks like it's really intact. And this really looks like it's going around the periosteum around the bone. And here we can see this really large soft tissue mass with kind of radial speculations in it. And then there's the PET scan and the CT scan. So we can see that it's hypermetabolic on the PET scan and that there are some osteoid, uh, there is osteoid matrix on the CT scan. Um, so again, I'd be concerned about a malignant um, lesion. Good. So this was an osteosarcoma. A uh, little bit unusual in that this is primarily involving the, the uh, uh, periosteum. This was a chondroblastic osteogenic sarcoma. Uh, there is certainly some abnormality within the marrow space, but as we'll see, most uh, bone tumors will primarily affect the medullary space and extend out and blow through the cortex. So this is a little bit unusual, a chondroblastic osteogenic sarcoma. But good, you, you described it really as a malignant lesion, and so it really it has to be worked out as such. Okay, now Michael? <clears throat> uh, John, it, it, that's not awfully common, is it? Uh, no, this isn't one of the more common osteogenic sarcomas. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, so 18 year female left up her arm pain. Labs in history unremarkable. So she's got this expansile. Um, lytic lesion with a bunch of kind of like areas of lucency and scalloping with a pathologic fracture, I guess in the proximal humeral diaphysis. Um, now, now in plain films, whenever you see a bone lesion, one of the things you have to describe uh, like the, matrix. the margins. The margins. Oh, so so the, the, margins the, matrix, are, the margins. The margins are actually pretty well defined and kind of okay. scalloped and Corticated. The cortex is thin, but it's it's not like ill-defined margins. I don't think. Yeah. So uh, there is a fracture, though. Yeah, there's a pathologic fracture with a little piece displaced. And that's how it was uh, picked up, right? And there's kind of yes. low. It's uptake on bone scan, but it's not like super hot. It's kind of low-grade ratio tracer uptake. Um, so CT, we see it's you know, there's a lot of cortical involvement, cortical scalloping, and lucency. And irregularity with medullary expansion and you know, pathologic fracture. This is what the 3D reconstruction shows. And so I guess I want to see pathologic it. fracture in a. Okay. Yeah, I, was, I guess I want to see if MRI if there's like fluid fluid levels or something okay. or. There's the MRI. Oh, uh, so the MR makes this look a lot more aggressive. Um, you can see now that there's extensive soft tissue extension outside of the bone where that fracture is. It's actually protruded out and it's going into the adjacent muscle and soft tissue. So this is going to be something malignant. Yeah. So this was a fibroblastic osteosarcoma. Okay. Usually you think of osteosarcomas as having uh, a, a kind of wide zone of transition here at the interface with the bone. This one had a very sharp zone of transition, which is usually reserved for Benign lesions, but this was not a benign lesion. This was a, a, a malignant lesion, and then we can see um, the fracture. It, it actually looked on the X-ray looked like a cyst. Um, yeah, it really looks like a, yeah. You know, you could certainly. I think a lot of people would think about an aneurysm of bone cyst with maybe a aneurysm of bone cyst. That, 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 that would be my first guess. Yeah. But these fibrogenic osteosarcomas can, can look like this, and it has a very narrow zone of transition, which suggests that it may be more on the benign side, uh, but this one was not benign. 
because uh, in this patient um, with osteogenic should should have um, pain from the get go and and the, this kind of kind of late in the game. Yeah. Okay, uh, Ashley, what do you think of this one? All right. So looking at the proximal tibia, we're seeing a pretty large lesion expanding through the uh, uh, the epiphysis uh, into the metadiathesis of the uh, tibia. There's a pretty low T1 signal um, and increased central T2 signal. Um, I'd like to see some more slices. It looks pretty well defined in terms of the area of transition superiorly, but oh, no, uh, definitely not that uh, benign. Looks pretty aggressive actually going posteriorly. Um, I think there's some, yeah. It's like an osteoblastic. So this is an osteoblastic, and you can see a lot of the hyper. So this is thickening of the trabecular bone here, producing the signal loss with replacement of the fat. Uh, though I, I never even attempt to determine the histology type of the of the lesion. I would just call this a uh, likely malignant uh, bone lesion, and then have it worked up and get pathology. But you can also see that there's a lot of tumor going into the periosteum with lifting of the periosteum off the bone here. Uh, very, a lot oh, of malignant signs. Once you, uh, John, once you, one, once you see um, invasion of the, um, um, uh, of the uh, bone itself, um, then, then you start thinking malignancy, don't you? Invasion of the bone. Uh, I'm not what you're well, well, I'm not, 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 not uh, with the cortical bone. Um, if you, yeah, if you look at the cort bone. cortex, and it's an irregular, kind of like rat eat rat Absolutely. eating. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's when you start thinking malignancy. Yeah. And then it looks I, like there's this destruction central. Also with malignancy, you tend to get destruction centrally, and uh, right. which is what we're seeing here as well. So, so it, the first thing that came to my mind when I looked at that was malignancy. I, yeah, you're right. Okay, Jennifer, what do you think of this? Um, so he's a teen male with knee pain. It looks like the knee joint is preserved. Um, there may be some cloud-like matrix kind of along the proximal tibiofibular joint and there's that sclerotic lesion um so this would need evaluation with further cross-sectional imaging such as mri so this is 9309 this is the mr okay so here we can see marked enlargement of the proximal tibia and there's a yeah. solid Did mass -like you see lesion. do you see enlargement of the tibia here on the plane film I don't see it there. Okay. So I don't think this is enlargement of the tibia. Mm -hmm. It's a soft tissue mass. Yeah. Uh, extending beyond. It's infiltrating the tibia and then also a soft tissue mass extending posteriorly and there's some fluid fluid levels. <laughs> um, so this could be like a telangiectatic osteosarcoma. Good. Yep. Very good with the fluid level in it. Exactly. Okay, uh, Michael. Do you mind going back? Is there a fracture on the radiograph? You're talking right. about right in here? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I didn't I see it on the MR, so I thought maybe it was just yeah, a... Yeah, I, I didn't see any edema, LSC. You know, I guess there could be something that is kind of hidden by all the tumor, but I, I wouldn't call it a fracture. But there's right. obviously... Uh, tumor going through the cortex into the soft tissues. Thanks. It would definitely be painful, uh, and and nothing like that is described. Yep. Is it? It's a knee knee pain, not 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 a tibial pain. Okay, uh, um, Michael. Thirty-two-year-old male, knee pain for several months. First thing I notice is there's probably a joint effusion. Um, and then I assume on sagittal, you know, if I'm being faked out, if that's a lytic lesion within the femur, 
kind of the central femur distally. Mm -hmm. And now when I look on uh, coronals, I think there's kind of like a some lucency, almost kind of like permeated maybe, or is that, am I making that up? Anything in a tibia. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, and then there's some periosteal reaction. Just looks pretty smooth down at the tibia. Um, so I was making that up earlier. So, um, so we have this large soft tissue mass which involves the bone and cortical breakthrough in the posterior tibia. Extending out there, it's you know pretty heterogeneous. So I mean, this is you know concerning for like could this be some sort of malignancy? I don't know if it's like a parasteal osteosarcoma or para. Well, yeah, I. Yeah, this probably starts too much, bone too here. Much invasion into the it bone. goes through it, and then it grows much more rapidly out in the soft tissues because it's not constrained by bony constraints. Got it. And okay. So here we can here we can see that lesion. So it really looks it looks like a bone tumor, which is yeah. breaking through the cortex, extending into the soft tissues, and it's certainly a lot bigger than you would have expected from the plain films. There are the axial images showing, and it's typical kind of an appearance of margins of osteosarcoma. Usually, yeah, can, we, can we go black to the plain films? Sure. On plain films, we typically say they had a wide zone of transition. On MR, these osteosarcomas tend to be relatively sharply defined. Got it. There's the plain film. Oh, uh, that's like, that's just very, very hidden. And then you can see some oh, issues my. coming back in here. Yeah, very, very difficult to see. And then you certainly saw the effusion. Uh, uh, clinically, you could probably feel it better than you can by looking at it on an yeah, X-ray. I think so too, yeah. Okay. Okay, here's the bone scan. And it's, you know, it's radio tracer uptake and bone scan. Ultra noise. Yeah, this is oh, a small okay. cell type osteosarcoma. All right, uh, Ashu. All right, looking at the proximal tibia, it looks like a very large uh, mixed lesion, most some mostly lytic components. Um, it's permeative. I don't see a very clear zone of transition. Um, Does it go to the articular uh, surface? I it could. Yeah. It could actually. I, I think on the sagittals, it almost looks like it does. What does that lucency on a, a AP view uh, centrally um, right there? What does that look like? Um, like a like a fibroma or? Well, oh, maybe it's so it, it's certainly some kind of tumor, isn't it? Yeah, and there's there's actually a lot of uh, periosteal. Uh, reaction there on uh, along the uh, medial aspect of the tibia and the lateral aspect of the tibia. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, this is what the T1 weighted images look like. Okay. Almost looks maybe partially expansile even. Um, pretty heterogeneous. Um, Actually, these must be PDs because the T1 would be lower in signal intensity. Yeah. This is probably T1 and in, in T1 and yeah. So dark on T1, bright on T2, and it looks like it extends past the cortex on the T2 so, as well. So what do you think it is? Uh, I think it it looks it looks it looks aggressive. Uh, I would be worried about that. <laughs> We're the section of the osteogenic sarcoma. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would be worried about a uh, osteosarcoma. So this was a low grade central osteosarcoma. A low grade for the pathologist. Right. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, normal or abnormal? Uh, so this looks abnormal. Um, there is an expansile lesion in the mid diaphysis of the femur. We, we lost the image. Oh, back. Yeah, yeah and see and now it's infiltrating the cortex here. Yes, so there's some endosteal scalping. I don't 
see any definite cortical breakthrough on these images. There is some muscle atrophy posteriorly. Yeah, and there's a lot of inhomogeneous signal here. And this happened to be in an area that had been previously radiated. And so one type of uh, osteogenic sarcoma is a radiation-induced osteosarcoma. Uh, Michael. How, how common is that, John? Uh, nowadays, it's very uncommon. Uh, but uh, because people are very careful with radiation. But there was a time when uh, people, even, in fact, there was a time when people would use x-rays to fit shoes. But, uh, uh, but before we recognize the, the myriad of problems with overdose of radiation, uh, it was a, a bit more common. Yeah, I remember those days. I remember dermatologists losing their hands. Yeah. Right. Okay. Next. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, this one isn't as subtle on radiograph. Um, so we have like a regular um, kind of ossified matrix and periosteal reaction along the posterior aspect of the distal femur. Um, and it looks like there's probably some soft tissue mass effect in that region kind of surrounding it. So just looking uh, at these, what's the differential? This is a kind of an ant mini situation. Uh, I mean, this could be... It wouldn't look exactly like this, but in this region, you got to be worried about like the tug lesions, critical desmoid, that you don't call it malignant. Um, but this is a little more irregular than that. Um, so I think this is more of a, you know, uh, osteosarcoma type picture. I don't okay, think that looks like a desmoid, does it, John? No, no. I'm just saying in this region, when you see regularity, that's not this case, but that's one thing you have to think of. Okay. Yeah, of yeah. course, but. And that's what are, the types, what are the types of tumors back here that you're concerned about, and what are their malignant potentials? Um, I mean, like osteosarcoma. Well, let's just go on here. So or osteal or periosteal. Right. Periosteal. Okay. And then here is what it looks like on the MR. So this is... So you see this, uh, there's, you know, pretty thickened periosteal reaction with this kind of heterogeneous mass that's well circumscribed extending off that posterior periosteum. And it looks like a periosteal sarcoma. Okay. There's the and it's bone pretty scan. hot on radio tracer. Yeah, so that's a periosteal osteosarcoma. And then uh, we're going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, actually, what do you think of this one? Um, okay, 44-year-old female with right knee pain. Um, you can look at the posterior aspect of the distal femur. Again, you see some significant periosteal reaction and uh, lucency on the AP views extending through the lateral femoral condyle. Um, I need to get some, some extra imaging here. Okay, so on the T1-weighted images, we see a soft tissue kind of uh, heterogeneous uh, on T2 and low, uh, homogeneous low T1 signal involving the lateral femoral condyle extending to the soft tissues with cortical, um, uh, it looks like a cortical break and uh, periosteal reaction. Um, still worried about parosteal osteosarcoma, probably. Uh, well, so, so, but this one looks a bit more aggressive than the last one, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, definitely on the plane films and That's yeah, the it's one. definitely, yeah, this was more, and it's this one. Yeah, this might be periosteal osteosarcoma. I can, I guess you can see it in the. Notice that this one is extending over here. to the lateral side and that's mm -hmm. important. And we've got extensive bone involvement in this one, which we didn't on the prior one. And this so looks was, worse to me than the last one. Yeah. So that's what the histology looks like, medullary lesion. Okay. And this was a, a kind of a bad para osteo osteosarcoma. Uh, and, uh, and the para osteosarcoma tend to originate from the outer fibrous layer of the periosteum. Uh, 
uh, in this particular case. Uh, this is a rare, really very aggressive form of paraosteosarcoma. This one is really de-differentiated and uh, is certainly much more aggressive. Okay, and then, then there's this lesion. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this lesion? Uh, John, that last one is almost a misnomer, isn't it? A misnomer? A mis yeah, because it's so damaged. Yeah, I, I, you know, if I was just looking at this and reading it, I would call this an osteosarcoma and not say a perosteosarcoma. Yeah, that's, that's what I would by, by By histology. But this really has more of the growth characteristics of a really a malignant osteosarcoma. And in this particular case, it was really a de-differentiated form. So this is one that you'd really have to put in the high-risk category of an osteosarcoma. I, I, don't, I don't know why they put parosteal in there. Uh, it's probably the pathologist who did that. Yeah. But for many imaging criteria, I think it would have to be treated as a very aggressive lesion as opposed to the typical parosteosarcoma, which we saw in the first case. And right. Then, uh, yeah. And then, Jennifer, what do you think of this lesion? Um, so here I see some periosteal thickening. It looks like a soft tissue mass kind of along the metadiaphysis, and here we do see an associated soft tissue mass with some enhancing peripheral components and intrinsic enhancement. Um, so this is another one I'd be concerned about, like a parosteal or juxtacortical osteosarcoma. Yeah, th this one I wouldn't put as a parosteal. Parosteals are almost always posteriorly here. Uh, straight okay. posterior. Once they become lateral or anterior, uh, they're typically periosteal osteosarcomas, which has a significantly worse prognosis than a parosteal osteosarcoma. So this was a periosteal osteosarcoma. So if you look at the two, the parosteal sarcomas occur in the second to the fifth decades. It's the most common surface tumor of bone. Uh, Actually, the only side I've ever seen one is a posterior distal femur, right where we've seen this one, but the prognosis is quite good. Periosteal osteosarcoma occurs in the second and third decades. They're much less common, fortunately. They tend to occur everywhere except posteriorly. The prognosis is better than osteosarcoma, but it's significantly worse than parosteosarcoma. So it's important to be able to differentiate these two uh, when you're, when you're uh, looking at them. So way, way back when, uh, uh, I'm sorry, John. Way back when they didn't differentiate, and they that they considered both of these as uh, much better prognostic uh, than than osteogenic sarcs, and uh, okay. they they treated them with local excision or block excision. Yeah, which is fine for the periosteal. May not be fine for the periosteal, right? Yeah. Okay, and let's move on to fibrogenic sarcomas. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay, region, so I should say. There's this predominantly lucent lesion in the distal femur with these kind of well, well outlined bands of bone, like networks of, looks like just really thickened type of trabecular type networks. And maybe there's a little bit of expansion um, so MRI, it looks like kind of a well demarcated um, lesion. It's heterogeneous appearance. I assume those are post-contrast images. Over here. With kind of, yeah, with kind of peripheral enhancement with maybe few stipulations of central enhancement. This is very, huh. It, the, just given the margins and kind of how the cortex is preserved, I don't exactly know what's going on here, but I assume it's some sort of benign fibrous type, like osseous fibrous type lesion. So it looks very uniform on the T1, but very heterogeneous yeah. on the PD fat sets. And then we can see just a little tiny bit of marginal enhancement that you might think would, could be a cyst, but we see there's too much internal structure for it to be yeah. a cyst. And then here's the CT scan where you can see those trabeculars yeah. better. Yeah, and on CT, it looks like it's, it's kind of this thick trabecular pattern. It's very well corticated. There's not really 
Like, I don't see, like, you know, you know, bony, like, aggressive bony destruction. It is, has some uptake. I don't know, some, like, osseous fibrous type benign lesion. Yeah, this is a desmoplastic fibroma. So it was a benign lesion, but it was a benign fibrous uh, mass. In the current young people. And they tend to be resected with wide, re wide resection. Okay, uh, Hashu. All right, so we're looking at the uh, the tibia, the proximal tibia here. A lot of arrows. Looks like there is a, a focal lucent lesion and a bunch of other small, less prominent lucent lesions within the proximal tibia. On the MRI, we can see that it expands uh, beyond the cortex, and there's cortical disruption. There is um, there's some soft tissue mass there. It's pretty heterogeneous, um, expanding past the the bone. Um, and okay, so now we're looking at the different patients, the hip. same same pathology, same pathology, and we see an an expansiolytic lesion um, here within the, the the pubic rami on the left. Um, and you know, on T1, uh, it's a very homogeneous appearance on T1. Yeah, it's, it's pretty homogeneous. It's well defined. I don't see periosteal reaction, really. Here's another same lesion in another patient. Oh, okay, so now we're looking at a, a lytic expensile lesion of the um, the ulna um, distally. Um, the narrow zone of transition. Yep, and there's some. There might be some. There's, there's some some bone in there. I mean, I don't know. It looks, looks almost very low and almost be like a non-ossifying fibroma or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it looks like it's fibrous almost, low signal intensity. Here's some other yeah. ones. Another bones. Okay, so yeah, definitely low T1 signal. Oh, we see it in the in the calcaneus here. Um, very well demarcated um, trabecular lines of bone so there. So, so all these look very fibrous. Uh, uh, kind of a typical thing. appearance of fibrous lesions. But again, uh, just be careful if you try to make histologic diagnosis based upon MR because you can. You can lose a lot. These are all additional plastic fibromas of the bone, just like that last one. Okay, uh, Jennifer. Now, now the, the whole set of lesions that are that kind of you can separate out that are in the tibia. Let's see, do we have time? Yeah, we got time. So now we're going to talk about some tibial lesions. So here's a ten-month-old male. With that prior example with the fibroma appearance, would you rec for any of those lesions, would you recommend biopsy? I think all lesions like this need to have histologic proof before you can really progress to, uh, to treat them properly. Okay. Thank you. And, and can they look as, as, as aggressive as that one that expanded through the, uh, the cortex? Uh, uh, that's why plastic um, fibromas can be treated um, with yeah. uh, with cur curettage or a wild excision. Yeah. Okay. And then so, uh, so, then, so, then replacement. So sorry, and that those moids are not malignant. Yeah, these can extend beyond the bone, uh, so they, they can look fairly aggressive. But when when they do extend past the past the cortex, then what you do is you have to do an excision and then um, grafting. But uh, you don't have to excise the extremity. Uh, Great. Okay. okay. So here we have a ten-month-old male. Uh, we can see there is an expansile lesion in the tibia and it looks like there is some cortical thinning um the margins are fairly well defined um but it does appear aggressive and here again we can see some periosteal reaction and an enhancing mass 
little bit maybe, not, not a lot. Mm -hmm. You can see the mass there. So, so wait, what happened here? What's this doing? Okay. Uh, okay. I so this is. I probably the recommend biopsy for this though. Okay. So what's the differential when you see a lesion here? For the tibia, it could be um, EG. Good. Infection. Good. Um, it doesn't really look like osteosarcoma. It's so smooth. Yeah, I, okay. I wouldn't put that in the usual one, but you cannot exclude it. That's right. Okay. But but what are the? Uh, I mean, uh, so one is ossifying fibroma. That's, uh -huh. that's what this one is. Uh, let's go through some more here. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this one? It's a 19-year-old male, left leg pain aggravation during running. So we kind of see this bilobed, loosened lesion. Maybe it's molly expansile with some thinning, kind of scalloping of the cortex and borders. Um, it's pretty, because it's kind of two separate, but bilobed lesion is pretty homogenous. Yeah, it looks like very it's bright. a cortical-based lesion here. Yeah, a cortically-based lesion. Um, yeah, this was another ossifying fibroma. But again, I think these you have to you have to biopsy. Now, uh, osteo the other uh, one of the other lesions you have to consider is is fibrous dysplasia, and because uh, this is a very common location for fibrous dysplasia, a kind of a more aggressive form of fibrous dysplasia is osteofibrous dysplasia, uh, which is also called an ossifying fibroma. They tend to occur in the first. Uh, the, these lesions that we're talking about here are primarily in the first and second decade. So they typically occur in, in kids or, uh, or uh, teenagers. Uh, and there's usually an awful lot of, uh, of, of emotions concerning it because they're kids. They occur in the diaphysis, typically in the middle distal thirds. And, uh, and they have these sharp demarcations. And the diagnosis is really between uh, fibrous dysplasia, osteofibrous dysplasia, less likely chronic infection, uh, EG uh, can do this. And then the, the one thing you always, the adamantinoma uh, is the uh, malignant lesion that also presents in this location. And it's often very difficult by imaging criteria to differentiate uh, adamantinoma from a uh, ossifying fibroma or osteofibrous dysplasia. So these uh, lesions typically need to be uh, biopsy because anamantinoma are treated as low-grade malignancies, where the others are treated as uh, benign lesions. And then they also uh, like to make sure that they're not eosinophilic granuloma. Okay. So anamantinoma typically occurs from 20 to 50-year-olds. 80% of all of these occur in the tibia. It's a low-grade malignancy. About 15% die of METs, typically to the lung, bone, lymph nodes. Uh, you can uh, see satellite lesions in these lesions. And then uh, now there's a lot of controversy concerning the differentiation of, between adamantinoma and the more uh, aggressive forms of ossifying fibroma. OK. Uh, let's see. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? 57 year old male, oh, pubic uh, pain. The, the, but let me just say one other thing. The other common lesion you can see in young kids in that location is also uh, Ewing sarcoma, but has a distinctly different appearance, and we'll talk about that later. Go ahead. Okay, so I see this large expansolytic lesion within the uh, pubic bone, superior pubic ramus on the right. Um, the cortex is thin, but it actually appears preserved somewhat and then on the ct you kind of see similar findings that we're seeing on this plain film this really large expansile lesion with something in the cortex um four years ago okay so we see this you know we see the mass there again kind of it's high signal intensity shows kind of heterogeneous but you know diffuse enhancement i'm wondering if this is like a plasma cytoma there we can see it here as well, T2 coronals. It's certainly a solid mass lesion. 
have that kind of uh, some inhomogeneous enhancement. Mm -hmm. You can see it here on all the different planes. That's what they did to it. So they resected it. Yeah, kind of a wide resection. Uh, they didn't play with it. Oh, okay. Uh, that, 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 that's a big, big incision. Yeah. So at the time of surgery, they, they called it a low-grade fibrosarcoma. Uh, eventually, they made the diagnosis of a desmoplastic fibroma. Uh, but, uh, but then when they sent it to the Mayo Clinic, they thought that it was a fibrosarcoma grade 2. So let's move on to fibrohistocytotic lesions. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this? So a uh, 37-year-old female, left shoulder pain for two weeks, papillary microcarcinoma in the thyroid, um, hot uptake at the left shoulder, SUV max 15.9. You can see that on the bone scan. At, um, or sorry, the, uh, the PET scan looks like there's uh, quite a bit of uptake um, there. It almost looks like a lymph node. Um, nope, nope, not in the, so it's in the shoulder. Um, proximal humeral um, metaphysis there. Looks like it's fairly bright on T2, almost looks cystic, but it uh, avidly enhances and homogeneously yeah. low on T1. Actually, you don't Sur really know whether it enhances or not. Surgical neck. Oh, yeah, we have a fat set. We don't know. It might not. Yeah. It might just so be. You have uh, to be very careful pseudo. with that. Um, looks like there. it's, okay, benign fiber system. So it looks pretty benign, actually, very well defined. Yeah, but again, this is something that I, uh, you know, you could, I would, I would kind of say it's probably benign. It doesn't blow out the cortex. It goes up to the cortex. Uh, it's got nice and spherical, very sharp uh, uh, demarcation uh, edges to it, and so forth. But uh, again, I think these kind of, as long as you find out that it's a solid lesion, I think these have to be biopsied. So, if possible, think, if possible, excisional biopsy. Um, Good. Yeah, so in, uh, just uh, local excision tends to be sufficient. Another example. Okay, I give the diagnosis to begin with. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think here? Well, I'm, yeah, that pelvic rim, I couldn't see it very well in the radiographs, but there's a large, yeah, I really can't see it here on the radiographs, but there's a large soft tissue mass hiding there along the left iliac wing, and it is suspicious for malignancy. Um, yeah, I guess there's the lytic and sclerotic appearance there in the left iliac bone retrospectively. Uh, this could be concerning for um, fibrosarcoma. Um, here we can see extension of the soft tissue mass into the adjacent lower abdomen and also along the left muscles, along the left iliac wall. Um, and we can see that it is hot on bone scan and increased metabolic uptake on the PET scan. Yeah, Ewing. Yeah, this was Ewing. So, uh, and the, obviously the pelvis is a very common location for Ewing's. Occasionally you can get Ewing's extraskeletal. Uh, I don't know if I have those in this review lecture. I have some in some of the other ones that we probably won't get to. Uh, and then, okay, uh, Michael. Okay, so left heel pain. Um, we can see in the left calcaneus compared to the right, there's kind of, you know, it's diffusely more kind of patchy sclerotic appearance, or the right has a much more normal trabecular bone pattern. Um, I don't, uh, so the MRI um, on the T1, it's just kind of this ill defined large area of uh, dark signal. 
And on the uh, sat uh, like the fat sated fluid sensitive signals, we see some patchy areas of increased signal throughout. Um, this looks like a little more aggressive here, like this kind of like a permeative type pat oh, osteoblastic healing sarcoma. Yeah, so so this one basically I'd be concerned about a malignant tumor. I, I would say just I would say. I would say this most compatible with an osteogenic sarcoma, looking at just the the, the MR. Uh, but any malignant, but this turned out to be an osteoblastic Ewing sarcoma. Uh, so again, uh, I, there, there are a few cases, few times when the imaging uh, findings are characteristic of histologic findings, but uh, in general, uh, uh, you can't really make a histologic diagnosis on MR in most of these. So this is the most common malignant bone tumor in children. Peak age is around 15 years. It tends to occur in the early teens. It's a malignant round cell tumor, 60% in long bones, and 44% in the metadiaphysis. Uh, let's go on and spend a little time on hem hematopoietic uh, abnormalities here. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? All right, so we're looking at a 55-year-old male with history of bone cyst. Um, looking at two coronal images, T1, and i um, guessing a fat set PD. Um, within the left uh, femoral neck, extending to the metaphysis of the left femur, um, we see this uh, pretty well-defined homogeneously low T1 signal. Um, and bright on, uh, bright on uh, T2 imaging, um, you know, it, it involves it involves part of the neck. Um, it involves the greater trochanter. Um, it doesn't look cystic. It doesn't look like fluid. Right. Um, so so it's, it's, it's too high in sensitivity on the T1, and it has too yeah. much internal structure on the PD on the like that. And the zona mm -hmm. transition is very sharp on these. Mm -hmm. Axial images. Yeah. Uh, looks almost macrolobulated um, on the axial sequences. And there might be some, uh, it might be extending through the, the cortex minimally there. I, I don't know. It's hard maybe. to see. Hard to see. Yeah, maybe certainly getting into the cortical bone here. Yeah. That's when, when it starts to look ugly. So In other words, invasive. So this is what they thought, uh, kind of non-specific findings, laposcrosis and mixofibrous tumor. Uh, I mean, it's the right location for that, but I, we'll see some of those later. And I, they're usually not quite this uniform. Uh, fibrous dysplasia, giant cell tumor, uh, or, or other possible things. And then, uh, Okay, so now wait a second. I think this is the same line. Okay. I believe this is the same one, but I'm not entirely certain. Oh, yeah. yeah. So th this was a plasma cytoma. So, uh, again, uh, uh, hematologic type lesions tend to be much more uniform in their signal characteristics than, than primary bone lesions. And they tend to be usually either diffuse or uh, their focal lesions are fairly sharply defined. And this was a plasma cytoma. Uh, and, uh, and this was in the setting of multiple myeloma. Okay, uh, Jennifer. So this is a 57-year-old female with lower back and leg pain for one year, but no history of trauma. Um, she does ha is osteopenic, and it looks like there is some compression of the superior end plate there. Yeah, at multiple L inputs. Yeah, yeah, multiple. Mm -hmm. A lot of loss I don't... Of, of density of the bones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't see a lesion yeah. 
Uh, yeah, this is the kind of lumbar spine that we want to turf to the neuroradiologist. Yes. I'm joking. Yeah. Uh -huh. It looks like there may be some kyph acute kypho or some kyphosis running through here. And yes. That's what the MR shows. Okay, so here in that region of kyphosis, there's a severe compression deformity. Um, it looks so, like most of that vertebral so body is missing. Yeah, now the neuroradiologist is going to trip it back to you as a bone radiologist. She also has multiple rounded lesions throughout the spine. Um, I'd be concerned about metastatic disease, uh, multiple myeloma. Here again, we can see multiple lesions in the spine, some soft tissue invasion of the spinal canal and the adjacent paraspinous musculature. Uh, Whenever you see a, a, a uh, body expanding posteriorly, you think malignancy. Right. So uh, this, this becomes a malignant just by a glance. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'll show that finding a little bit better in some other cases here. So here's some of the, uh, oops, sorry about that. That wasn't supposed to pop up. So this is a patient with multiple myeloma and uh, not well controlled. Okay. Oops, why is it doing that by itself? Hmm. Okay, uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay, so there's... Uh, first thing I see is there's a there's a lesion involving that superior right iliac wing with surrounding soft tissue involvement. Um, here. Yeah. Okay. There's also kind of heterogeneous appearance of the bilateral femoral heads, at least on the T1. And then when you just kind of look through the bones in general on T1, they they don't look normal. And then right over where your arrow is, there's kind of a big soft tissue mass extending off the kind of subtrochanteric region of the femur. And you can kind of, you know, see it actually bilaterally. That's a big soft yeah. tissue masses. So the large soft tissue masses, abnormal bone marrow edema kind ah, of throughout. So sure. again, thinking some sort of infiltrating marrow lesion okay. expanding so, out. Like so, so, myeloma. So, so this was a patient with multiple myeloma and uh, these these masses are kind of uncharacteristically low in signal intensity on the PD fat sat images. So typically, if it were a malignant lesion or even a plasma cytoma, they would be brighter on the PD fat sat. So you have to think about other possibilities that might fit in with that. And one of the things you can get is amyloidosis uh, if you have chronic long-standing multiple myeloma that's not well uh, treated. And this was amyloidosis of the hip joints uh, in the setting of multiple myeloma. Okay, uh, Ashu. <clears throat> All right, we have three coronal images of the <clears throat> of the wrist, and we can see that there is um, pretty abnormal bone marrow signal, especially on the T1s. It seems to involve uh, the distal radius and ulna and the uh, lunate and triquetrum, as well as the capitate there. The capitate also, there might be some, I uh, know oh, it looks okay on the GRE sequence, but um, there's some increased stir sequence also noted in the lunate and portions of, of the other uh, carpal bones including the triquetrum and also it seems to involve the fifth uh the fifth metacarpal there um and it's kind of patchy actually it doesn't involve the entirety of the cap uh, of the of the scaphoid there but it does um so i mean I, I would be worried about an infiltrative marrow process here yeah, yeah this is walton Stroms. Right. I think you just put this in that category of, of uh, it really looks like a diffuse infiltrative marrow disease. And there's a wide uh, differential for that. And again, it requires a biopsy to make the, uh, or some other clinical information to make the diagnosis. Okay. Uh, Jennifer? All right. This is a 55 year old with vague ankle pain. Um, we can see just a few abnormal decreased signal intensity on T1 images throughout the talus and the navicular and the calcaneal body. 
and it is increased in signal on the proton density images. Um, I don't see a soft tissue mass. Um, this could also be infiltrative bone malignancy, lymphoma. Okay. Yeah, this turned out to be lymphoma. Okay. Yeah, these infiltrative hematopoietic uh, diseases tend to infiltrate in amongst the trabecular bone, and they're not as destructive as the other lesions that we've seen. Uh, so when you see a lesion like that with, without the extensive trabecular and cortical destruction, then, then think about uh, hematopoietic processes. Uh, Michael? Okay, so 45-year-old male with neck mass. So what we see here in the femur is you kind of have this diffuse permeative uh, pattern throughout the bone with periosteal reaction, which doesn't, you know, looks like somewhat aggressive periosteal reaction. Right. So I'm worried about, you know, I mean, this looks like a malignancy of yeah. some sort. Yeah, it looks like a diffuse infiltrative disease. Well, yeah, and it's got low-grade uptake. And then on the MRI, we can actually see the kind of full extent of soft tissue involvement there is kind of entire, the uh, marrow's completely uh, infiltrated and there's soft tissue breakthrough and extension into the um, soft tissues. Yeah. So some sort of aggressive malignancy. Um, and where the, yeah, it's just kind of surrounding it. Cortex is completely thinned. Um, there's, I guess, some peripheral enhancement. And then, so and then what we see on, there's some, yeah. My nephew died of Burkitt's lymphoma. Oh my gosh. Age, age, age 15. Oh my God, you're kidding. Um, we... Well, that was many years ago. And um, yeah, that's terrible. He complained of, of knee pain. I had um, uh, an arthrogram and uh, everything looked fine, and the x rays looked fine. and. Uh, Eventually, uh, um, somebody picked up a lymph node uh, that was very hard and uh, yeah. uh, made, I made the diagnosis. It was too late. Oh, my gosh. Well, let's stop here, and we'll start with giant cell tumors. Uh, uh, Durkis lymphoma uh, is supposed to be in, in, in the African-American community, um, yeah. but um, my nephew... Uh, was from Lithuania, and uh, hmm. there's no connection there. <laughs> right. so, so it's kind of a, a very unusual situation. Right. He had diabetes from uh, type 1, so uh, I yeah. think that may have been something to do with it. Great. I don't know. 